Hello, my name's Tom Farrand from Marks and Clark in London, and you're listening to IP Fridays. Hello, and welcome to this episode of IP Fridays. Our names are Ken Suzanne and Rolf Clayson, and this is the podcast dedicated to intellectual property. It does not matter where you are from, in-house or private practice, novice or expert. We will help you stay up to date with current topics in the fields of trademarks, patents, design and copyright, discover useful tools, and much more. Welcome to episode 108 of the IP Fridays podcast. My name is Ken Suzanne, co-host of this podcast, and this is the last episode for the 2019 recording season. Both Rolf and I wish you a joyous holiday season, a happy new year, and we both hope that you will continue to listen to our podcast in 2020, as we jointly intend to continue posting new episodes on a monthly basis throughout the new year, always on the last Friday of every month. Today, our guest is Tom Farrand, the head of trademarks at Marks & Clark. Our discussion focuses on the ever-changing legal landscape of Brexit and the potential impact on intellectual property assets. Before we turn to the interview, let's look at a development in U.S. copyright law and procedure. In an overwhelmingly bipartisan vote, the U.S. House of Representatives passed the Copyright Alternative in Small Claims Enforcement Act, otherwise known as the CASE Act. In October 2019, the House passed H.R. 2426 by a vote of 410 to 6. The Act establishes a small claims court for copyright cases, which is an enormous step away from the current copyright claims process. In the current copyright system, if a copyright holder seeks to file an infringement claim against an alleged infringer, the rights holder is required to file in the federal court system. The federal court system can be difficult to navigate and creates a high barrier to entry for those attempting to protect their rights. With the growth of the Internet and content sharing social media platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Reddit, content creators have had a difficult time protecting their works and enforcing their rights. In the proposed small claims court, the claimant may have their case heard before a panel of three officers, who are each required to have at least seven years of extensive copyright law experience. Two of the officers must have experience in the evaluation, litigation, or adjudication of copyright infringement claims. There will be other officers who do not meet those qualifications, but they will be required to have a substantial familiarity with copyright law and experience in alternative dispute resolution. Although there is substantial congressional support for the CASE Act, There has been strong opposition from freedom of speech advocates and Internet advocates alike. The American Civil Liberties Union warns against the chilling effect for speech on the Internet. The organization recognizes that the proposed bill can do some good for rights holders, but it may discourage users from posting content, even when protected by fair use. The bill has passed in the Senate Judiciary Committee and is now waiting to be heard on the Senate floor. Now on to the interview with Tom Farrand. Our guest today on IP Fridays is Tom Farrand. Tom is the head of trademarks at the law firm of Marks & Clerk and is based out of their London office. Tom is a registered trademark attorney with more than 30 years experience, working with brand and intellectual property owners across a wide range of industries. Tom specializes in providing strategic advice on the many legal and commercial issues around the protection and exploitation of brands and IP. Tom is a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Trademark Attorneys. Tom has expertise in the sectors of food and drink, automotive, fashion, and sports. He studied business at the London Business School and has a first degree in mathematics from the University of East Anglia. Welcome, Tom, to IP Fridays. Thanks, Ken. It's a pleasure to be here. Excellent, Tom. Tom, noting that we are recording our podcast interview on December 6, 2019, what is the current status of Brexit? Uh, Yeah, thanks, Ken. Well, the current status is that an agreement was reached between the current UK government 
of uh, Boris Johnson's Conservatives uh, with the European Union about the terms of the UK's exit from the European Union. That agreement required uh, approval of uh, the Houses of Parliament uh, before it became law. Uh, partway through that approval process, the UK government opted to uh, pull the bill and uh, head for a general election. Um, the reason for doing that is that the uh, existing government didn't have a parliamentary majority uh, in the House of Commons and could not control proceedings to a efficient, sufficient degree. Um, their aim is to, uh, as a result of the election, have a majority in the House of Commons and therefore be able to uh, push through the laws required for the exit agreement um, to become f in force. Um, the current deadline by which the UK needs to leave uh, with this agreement is the 31st of January 2020. So the election is next week, the 12th mm -hmm. of December. Uh, if the uh, government gets its majority, um, then very likely they'll be able to push through this uh, bill for exiting the European Union according to the 31st January deadline. Interesting. Now, I assume that politics is a major uh, player here. How likely is politics uh, to play a role between now and the end of January 2020? Well, politics, I mean, Brexit has dominated politics in the UK for the last three and a half years, um, and it continues to do so. Under the Boris Johnson, the Conservative Party have positioned themselves very much as the party of Brexit and uh, their election slogan is to get Brexit done. Um, so their policy is very much to see Brexit through um, to, uh, I guess, respect the result of the referendum back in 2016 and um, take the UK out of the European Union. Um, I'm told that every single parliamentary candidate in the Conservative Party is on board with the policy of leaving the European Union. So I think it's a reasonable assumption that if the Conservatives get their majority, then um, the politics will play out that way and mm -hmm. the UK will leave. The opposition parties, almost all of them, are um, either for reversing the referendum decision or for holding a second referendum to uh, either ratify the agreement with the EU to leave or to reverse the decision originally and to go back into the European Union effectively. Um, it looks from all the opinion polls at the moment that the Conservatives will get their majority and be able to push on with Brexit. Um, but it's fairly tight and opinion polls have been wrong a sure. lot in recent years. So uh, I don't think anyone's counting, counting their chickens on this one. Focusing on IP, uh, Tom, has anything changed for IP owners as a result of the delay to Brexit? Um Nothing very substantive has changed, Ken, as a result of the delay. I think I do think actually IP owners are in a slightly better position in, as a result of the delay, um, and the reason for that is that the the IPO in the UK is much better prepared than it was at the end of March. Um, there were a number of laws that required amendment um, ahead of Brexit. Um, those laws are now in force. Some of them weren't at the end of March, so IP owners were faced with the risk of um, a few months or weeks with uh, suspect IP rights. That that window is closed now. The, the laws are in force. Um, so I think there's a lot more certainty about how things will play out. Um, there are still some gaps which remain in IP law that still need to be plugged by new new laws. Um, examples are unregistered design rate rights that are equivalent to the, the current EU version, um, the supplementary patent certificate regime um, that needs to be kind of reenacted partly in the UK, um, geographical indications which were very much an EU thing. Um, we don't really have any equivalent law in the UK as yet. So there's a few things that the UK government still needs to um, fix, um, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure how far up the list of priorities those will be. But for everything else, um, the delay has kind of got things in, in better shape, if you see what I mean. Sure. Let's talk about the impact. Um, how will Brexit impact trademark owners? I know a lot of people want to know the answer to that issue. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the, the main impact of Brexit is that um, the unitary right that was created by the European Union that gave you one trademark registration covering all the member states, um, that right will no longer apply to the UK. Um, that means in future, trademark owners will need to register their trademarks separately in the UK and in the other EU uh, territory. Um, and that adds to the cost, it adds to the administration of a trademark por portfolio. Um, the administrative burden is there as well in the short term because the UK IPO is going to create uh, new UK rights which will clone existing EU rights and cover the UK. Um, that will create around a million new trademark records. Um, now that's a lot of admin for the UK IPO. It also requires admin for companies and their representatives who keep records of these uh, registrations on their systems. So um, obviously firms like Miles and Clark will create new records. That's our business. We need to do that. We'll be the representative on lots and lots of these records. But equally, firms of, for example, US attorneys who um, keep records of non-US registrations on their system will need to create records and maybe the ultimate clients will be doing the same. So it's going to create quite a an amount of extra admin burden across the sure. trademark profession in uh, in the short term, at least. Will, will there be any particular steps that uh, trademark owners will have to take, let's say in in January or February of 2020, to get that uh, conversion, or is it be done automatically? Um, it's going to be done. It's going to be done automatically by the UK IPO, um, and they've already developed a numbering system so that you'll be able to distinguish um, cloned. EU registrations from normal UK trademark registrations. Um, there's no action, there's no fee required by the trademark owners that will happen automatically. Uh, because of the sheer volume, the UK IPO will not be writing to all the trademark owners to tell them, congratulations, you've got a new cloned right. Uh, they won't be issuing registration certificates. Um, and what they will do in terms of representative details will will be to take the name and address of the applicant's representative from the EU register. Um, and the UK IPO has said they will um, will take that across even when the representative is outside the UK. Um, so it just needs to be somebody resident within the European Economic Area, which is um, as was before Brexit. Mm -hmm. If um, a company only, is... Go ahead. I was going to say the only the only thing that will be required is um, there will be some trademark registrations that will require renewal. The renewal deadline will match the existing EU trademark deadline. So, for example, if there's an EU trademark that's due for renewal in early February, then the cloned UK right will require renewal by that deadline as well. The UK IPO has granted uh, a free grace period within which to get that done, uh, recognising that some will be very tight in terms of deadlines to get that done so it'll be free to renew late um, within the grace period that's very helpful tom and tom if a company is thinking of filing in the uk let's say in the middle of january uh what would what would you recommend in that circumstance a direct <laughs> filing or click the box for eutm yeah so when when there's a pending trade eu trademark application on brexit date um the UK IPO won't automatically create an application mirroring that EU application. So uh, in that situation, the EU trademark applicant will be required to reapply in the UK. The date of filing will backdate to the original date of the EU application, um, but there, there will be an application required and an application fee to be paid. Um, assuming Brexit does happen on the 31st of October. If somebody is thinking of filing in mid-January, then it would make sense to, uh, at that point, cover the UK at the same time um, because there's no way the EU trademark will be registered by the time Brexit happens and you'll have to go through the process of uh, reapplying anyway. Uh, now you just you mentioned the 31st of October. Is that sorry, uh, 31st January? I meant that's January. right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now um, let's talk about patents. How will Brexit impact patent owners? Okay, the impact on on patent owners is is much less than it is on trademark and registered design owners. Um, the European Patent 
convention is not an EU convention and the EU, uh, sorry, the EPO is not an EU institution. Um, so the European pa Patent Convention will continue very much um, as it does at the moment. And um, it's uh, a very successful institution and there's no sense in, in dabbling with that. I don't think there's any uh, immediate impact on that. I think the only thing really that, that's of potential concern is in the pharmaceutical industry with the SPC regime where there are still some um, sorting out of laws to to do uh, by the UK government to make that work properly. But in terms of the, the pure patent application and patenting and patent renewal processes, they are largely unaffected by um, Brexit. Okay. Switching gears to enforcement of intellectual property rights, once Brexit is in effect, how will Brexit affect enforcement of intellectual property rights? Well, for the moment, um, in terms of the unitary rights of the um, EU trademark and the EU registered design, then there are opportunities to go to court, for example, in the UK and get an injunction that um, has application across the whole of the European Union. Um, going forward, um, that option will still be available from within the EU, but obviously not from within the UK anymore. So taking action um, will need to be done separately in the EU and in the UK uh, if you want to stop infringement, for example, across the whole of um, the existing 28 member states. So um, it's, it's going to be a separate regime. Um, the UK courts will continue to enforce rights, but it'll only be in the UK, not in the whole of the European Union. Okay. And the, opportun the opportunities for forum shopping um, around the European Union will obviously be limited without the UK there um, as one of the options. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we often hear about exhaustion of rights and parallel imports. What will the role of Brexit play uh, with respect to those uh, issues? Well, um, what the UK government has said uh, in terms of exhaustion is the UK is going to continue to recognise the European Economic Area uh, regional exhaustion regime. So if uh, a product is put on the market anywhere within the European Economic Area, then the UK will regard rights as exhausted when products go from the EEA into the UK. Um, so that will essentially con continue to permit parallel imports from the EU into the UK uh, without infringement of rights. Um, the reverse, however, is probably not going to be true. So goods placed on the UK market um, by or with the consent of the IP rights holder after Brexit, um, they won't be considered to be exhausted within the European economic area. So parallel imports to the EU from the UK may require the right holder's consent and it may be open to the right holder to stop the goods um, at the border between the UK and the EU. Mm -hmm. And that might that might present some opportunities for companies to control their parallel imports in a bit, bit of a different way from the way they do that at the moment. Okay, as we near the end of our uh, interview, I'd like to ask you, are there specific actions that IP owners need to take ahead of Brexit? What do you think are the best practices? <laughs> at this stage, um, I think there's no specific action that's required. I think the UK IP owners made it pretty clear that uh, IP rights will be protected after Brexit and they've made a real commitment to uh, business and to IP owners that they you know, won't drop the ball on that and they have put into place virtually all the laws that are required um, to protect IP owners. So that means that there's no uh, specific general action required. Um, I think there is, however, a continuing recommendation for IP owners to make a review and continue to review their EU rights, uh, EU agreements and licenses and so on, just to make sure that there won't be any negative impact. Um, for example, license agreements covering the EU may require amendment um, so that in the future they are clearly going to cover the UK as well as the EU or not, just to make that clear. So 
Uh, I think there's some ongoing review of, of, of EU rights that's, that's kind of recommended and some uh, actions might flow out of that. Um, but I think otherwise uh, IP owners don't need to do anything directly to continue to protect their rights in the UK. Tom, I want to thank you for joining us today on IP Fridays. This has been very helpful and interesting. Thank you. It's a pleasure, Ken. Good to talk to you. That's it for this episode. If you liked what you heard, please show us your love by visiting ipfridays.com slash love and tweet a link to this show. We would be so grateful if you would do that. It would help us out to get the word out. Also, please subscribe to our podcast at ipfridays.com or on iTunes or Stitcher.com. If you have a question or want to be featured in one of the upcoming episodes, please send us your feedback at ipfridays.com slash feedback. Also, please leave us a review on iTunes. You can go to ipfridays.com slash iTunes and it will take you right to the correct page on iTunes. If you want to get mentioned on this podcast or even have comments within the next episode, please leave us your voicemail at ipfridays.com slash voicemail. You have been listening to an episode of IP Fridays. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of nor are they endorsed by their respective law firms. None of the content should be considered legal advice. The IP Fridays podcast should not be construed as legal advice or legal opinion on any specific facts or circumstances. The contents of this podcast are intended for general informational purposes only, and you are urged to consult your own lawyer on any specific legal questions. As always, consult a lawyer or patent or trademark attorney. Copyright 2014. All rights reserved.